Telf. He stopped on the side of the road uh, somewhere around the central plateau. Brendan, we appreciate this very much. You're in a winter wonderland, is that right? Oh, well, absolutely. Well, it's a, it's completely, I've never struck anything like it in my life in New Zealand. I mean, there we were driving north uh, through Taihapi. We thought it was a bit early to stop for a coffee, so I thought we'll have one in Waiuru or somewhere because there's a museum there that my wife would like to see. And uh, we were about 10 minutes, I suppose, out of Taihapi, 20 minutes. I was just looking on my phone, 20 minutes from Waiuru. We went around the corner and suddenly the whole of our world was white. Everything was white. The road, the trees, the mountain, snow was pouring down. And I, I couldn't work out, Martin, whether I'd arrived at the New Zealand first annual conference or the <laughs> Act Party <laughs> ele- election oh, campaign. Oh, go, was, go I see. There's always a good political was, drive to be had well. there. Yeah, yeah. And look, but, the, you know, the thing is about when you're in the snow, before we get on to the sport, it's absolutely beautiful and gorgeous, apart from the fact that it's freezing cold, it's wet, it's slushy. And also when you're on the roads, of course, it's doubly dangerous. Yeah, well, I just felt a wee bit concerned because you don't really have any control over the vehicle in these conditions. And um, uh, the other remarkable image I remember seeing were entered into a passing lane and it was a big, long passing lane that was climbing up the hill. So I could see in front of me and there probably was 20 or 30 vehicles, most of them big trucks, but also a a lot of ordinary uh, vehicles. Not one single car in that uh, passing lane was in the actual passing lane. We were all just cribbing along at about 40, 50 k's and uh, was with a huge sigh of relief once once we got through uh, on the road to Aukuni that suddenly I started seeing green fields and green hills again and now it's fine. Uh, Aukuni, I imagine, is having a fantastic day with all this traffic that's pouring through like we are. It's going to stop and have lunch here. But yeah, it was a wee bit scary, but um, uh, just, a, just a, a snow pocket of maybe, I don't know, 10 or 15 k's uh, in and around Waiuru. But they've closed the desert road and I imagine it'll be some time before they open it. All right. Well, uh, just as tough, uh, an, an awful segue and a clumsy segue, but for the football ferns to break through um, that Filipino defence last night, um, just a frustrating game to watch, Brendan, wasn't it? Because after the euphoria of Norway, you know, you got you know, people have got to get used to the fact that this is a World Cup that no win comes easy, not even a draw comes easy. Other yeah. teams are yeah. going to rearrange their tactics. They're going to do whatever they can to stop you playing. And full credit to quote Sean Fitzpatrick to the Philippines because their coaching staff got it right. They were able to sit back, absorb, give us the ball, and we couldn't really do much with it. Yeah, I mean, it was, as you say, it was frustrating. They weren't as sharp or as composed or as precise with their play as they were at Eden Park last week, which really surprised me. They looked uh, a cut above anything I'd ever seen from a, a women's football team of any level in New Zealand. And there were patches of that again last night. I think on the overall run of the match, they probably deserved a draw. Um, they were better on attack. They had created more opportunities, didn't they, on attack, but they weren't able to finish them. They had one goal disallowed, which, yeah, I guess the VAR and its ultra kind of close up uh, look at um, what's her name Wilkinson that she was half her arm was offside yeah, so yeah. I think they probably deserved a point from the match do you not think yeah look you know if it comes down to just chances and that's what you know look one of those goes in the, you know the save at the end was world class I mean I often criticise the, the female goalkeepers for not being nearly as athletic yeah. as, the, as the men and, and not as worry rubbery and not as you know don't have that kind of gymnastic edge to them but that save was as good as you'll see in any game of football. And that, that could have and perhaps should have been a goal. Look, it's one of those matches, mate, you lick your wounds at the end of it, but they've got to regroup really quickly because now we play simultaneous matches on Sunday night. So why we yes, play the yes, Swiss, yes. Norway play. And look, you can look at all the permutations and commutations. The first thing, Brendan, is that we can't lose. It's as simple as that. We can't lose the game. Well, I also imagine that the two winners of those two matches will probably be the two teams that go through. I mean, if Switzerland uh, wins uh, at the expense of the Philippines, they'll certainly go through. And, uh, sorry, uh, uh, um, the Philippines are playing Norway. If Norway beats the Philippines, even Norway, I think, can get through if they pile up enough goals. Yeah, yeah. Uh, Because it could come down to goal difference, couldn't it? Well, it makes Um, that missed uh, penalty uh, against Norway in the 90th minute, mate. I mean, now all of a sudden that comes back into play as well. Look, at, you know, and this, again, you know, I, I know that we always, in New Zealand, when we lose a sporting encounter, we lament here. But this is a Filipino side playing their very first World Cup, and they did what we did against Norway. They've just achieved their first victory, and they'll be celebrating like we were on, what, last Thursday night? Also, I think, to put things in perspective again, just uh, kind of extending the point that you made earlier, that here's a group 
where the top seeded team hasn't yet scored a goal from two matches no. and all four teams still have a chance to go through to the next round. And this is, as you say, this is the reality of World Cup at most levels. It's not, you know, the Australian cricketers getting beaten all those years ago by Zimbabwe. Where's Zimbabwe? Someone said. Where's Zimbabwe? You see it in rugby and you see it in football and now you're seeing it in this particular football World Cup. There's just that pressure, that tension, that uh, experiences that a lot of players have never encountered before and it affects the way they play on the field. But, uh, yeah, I think it was a defensive lapse, wasn't it, that allowed yeah, that it goal was. if you look yeah. at the replay. Yeah, it was gone. There were yeah. three, three black jerseys uh, waiting for that board just off the goal line and the goalkeeper and uh, Bolden somehow or another got ahead to it and beat all four of those defenders. So they'll be, they probably would have had a hard night's sleep last night thinking, how the hell did we let that through? Yeah, you've got to regroup though and, and, and you've got to, you know, sort of look at, at, at what you did do well and we did create chances and that, you know, if we'd gone through that whole game, yeah. Brennan, and we'd huffed and puffed and we'd battled and we hadn't actually created a decent chance but as you say, look, you know, there was an offside goal. Yes, it's offside. There's no such thing as a little bit offside. You're offside. We hit the post once, yeah, you know, and, yeah, you know, yeah. and we had that chance at the end. So, we were, I, I, you know, I just wonder whether or not Yitka's going to have to have a serious look at some of the fossils in this team because, um, you know, Ali Riley, Percival didn't really play well last night. Wilkinson looked a bit sort of slow and old and then they brought on Longo, yeah, who, yeah. who to me was the worst substitution because I thought that Paige Riley was the one player who could perhaps stretch the pitch a bit. But, hey, look, we're still in it. I mean, and, and you know, if you'd asked me at the beginning of the tournament, if we go into that Switzerland game, the last game, needing a result to qualify, I probably would have taken that. Because I didn't think we were going to beat Norway. So I, I'm kind of looking pretty positively um, still. Now, just testing your knowledge, where is Switzerland in the world rankings? Um, Switzerland are 20, New Zealand 26, Norway were 12, and the Philippines 46. But, yeah. but the reality okay. of it is, mate, you've got to put, you know, this is all kind of cumulative over a year or over a couple of years. And because the Philippines have only just started playing, yeah. well, then they haven't, they haven't had, had enough matches for ranking points. You know, and I actually think Norway are probably a little bit overvalued. But anything under about 10 in the world in women's football, it's pretty much a much of a muchness, mate. I think anyone can beat anyone, as this group is proving. Mm, for sure, for sure. Anyway, uh, roll on. Well, let's move back. on to the British Open then, mate, because Ricky Ponting, I knew he loved his golf, but I didn't think he was capable of winning a major. <laughs> Who, Ricky Ponting? Yeah. Winning a major golf. Well, right. Brendan, it's a joke, you fool. They kept yelling Ricky Ponting at the guy Harmon every time he took up the tee at the British Open. Did oh, you know okay. that? Yeah, yeah. They... Well, well, no, I haven't, actually. I've been, I'm, I'm, I'm stuck in the middle of the North Island. I've right. been watching television or reading. Okay, well, papers, sorry. Okay, yeah, well, let, me, let me try that joke again. Brendan, Ricky Ponting won the British Open. Uh, no, he didn't, because when I last saw Ricky Ponting play on golf, he hits the ball almost as far as Rory McIlroy, whereas poor old Brian Harmon, um, I think he'd be struggling to outdrive me. I mean, this is how far off the pace this guy should have been at the British Open. Major championships are set up for the big hitters and the long hitters. You know, they have these par threes that go for 250, 260 yards, um, and the course is usually closer to 8,000 yards and 7,000. And this guy, Brian Harmon, is ranked 142nd on the US PGA Tour in driving distance. But what he did better than anyone else on that course at Hoylake, the Royal Liverpool Golf Club, is he kept the ball in play. Yes, he was having to play second shot, sometimes 30 or 40 yards behind his playing partners, but far better to be 30 or 40 yards behind in the middle of the fairway than stuck into that brown, ugly, niggly sort of cabbage and rough where many were putting their long tee shots. So he outthought a lot of those guys, and he's always been a very good putter. And how's this for a statistic? He had 44 putts to Royal Liverpool last week under 10 feet and he made every single one of them from 44 44 out of 44 wow. with his putting so you know the old saying you drive for show but you putt for dough and little Brian Harmon 70 Ks 38 years of age and his experience when he was leading at half the halfway stage uh, only by two shots I thought, this guy can call on 12 or 15 years on the U.S. tour. He's won a couple of tournaments. He was up there, I think, at the top of the leaderboard in the U.S. Open a few years back. And the experience might just kick in. And it did. He went further and further away from these guys and won by six shots. The only guy that wins by six shots in major championships is a guy called Tiger Woods. That's right. Yeah. 
a, a remarkable victory by an unremarkable golfer. Yeah, and you know the fact that uh, he had the five shot lead after two, how that squeezed down to a two shot lead during the third round, but he got it back to five. He goes after fifty four holes with a, a really handy lead, increases his lead. You know, is this great for golf, Brendan? I've always said that to me. Um, men's golf is the hardest, toughest competitive sport in the world because any one of 100 players can win every single weekend. I'll extend that now out to 140 or 150. Well, when he, now he, he, although he was 142nd in driving distance and he's on average about 35 to 40 yards behind uh, Rory McIlroy when they, they tee off if they're on the same group, uh, he is ranked, I think, about uh, 28th in the world. So his putting is, is what, in his short game, is what kept him going. What I, what I like about seeing these guys, these unlikely winners, is that it kind of is a very effective counter-argument to these people that say, oh, you know, the golf courses you know, are too long. We've got to start making these golf courses so long as taking all the short hitters out of the game. Well, it isn't. And they narrowed those fairways. Sometimes there was only about 10 or 15 yards where you had to land the ball or you were on the first kind of rough, which wasn't too bad. And so seeing a guy like Harmon win on a tough, demanding course where so many major champions didn't even make the cut shows that you don't have to have, um, you know, these huge, big, long courses uh, to take small and, you know, shorter golfers uh, out of the mix. And um, I think everyone who doesn't hit the ball very far will be thinking, yeah, Brian Harmon is my, um, my, new, cha- my new champion. JK's world of golf.co.nz. There is a absolutely readable blog on there every week now from Brendan Telfer. And thank you to JK's. I mean, it's a, it's a, it's a must. Let's talk about the Warriors. And your question to me was are they uh, guaranteed to make the top eight? No, not guaranteed. 28 points at the moment. The cutoff is 24 points. So there's five games left. So, or six games because the Warriors don't play this weekend, but they get that guaranteed two, two points. So five games left. Yeah, they get so, two points. Yeah. Yeah, yeah. So just yeah. do the math. Brendan, you know, they're going to have to win two out of the last five, uh, maybe three out of the last <laughs> five to be absolutely sure. But the other thing, you know, that comes into the equation, of course, these other teams play each other. So they're effectively four point games if you win. Yeah, yeah. So I, th- yeah. I think the better question yeah. is are they going to make the top four or the top six. Uh, at the moment, they're sitting in fourth spot. Again, I think if they win three out of their last five, it's probably good enough to retain a top four spot. I think that they'll finish top six. And what it, my, my point is very long-winded, I'm sorry, is that they'll get a home semi-final. That's what I, you know, be it in the first round, uh, if, if they're in the top four, they play away, but then they'd get, if they lose, they get it. Or the first round, if they're fifth and sixth, they get a home semi. And that's going to be another massive um, earner out there at Mount Smart, mate, because at the moment, 20-something thousand a crowd, they're clocking a million bucks a weekend, mate. Good, Very good coin. <laughs> Well, they they uh, they probably need it. The other thing here, which I quite like, is that you know how we've whinged and moaned, and you and I are, are in there with the rest of them over the years about the the tough breaks that the Warriors get. And I think there's probably some merit in that argument. Uh, but I just like the fact that you know I always argue in sport, and I've said it many times: what goes around comes around. You have bad luck one week, you have good luck next week. They had some good luck there last week. Um, I see the you know the, the coach of the other team was whinging and moaning about a couple of crucial decisions that went against. Uh, went against his team, and then they got that uh, drop goal. And uh, I don't know whether Johnson's got such a great record overall with his attempted, uh, you know, one you know Field goals. golden point drop mm. goals. And I didn't think he'd get that one. I thought he usually needs two or three before he gets one. So they had a bit of luck there last weekend, and that just shows what goes around comes around. There is no real bias. There's good luck and there's bad luck, and the Warriors probably, if they're honest, had a bit of luck, and they got away at a one-point win, and uh, that was priceless because they get those two important points. So, um, yeah, I'd, I'd like to see them get in the top four, but um, I don't know. Yeah, somehow. Well, the, you uh, know, at the I moment, they've won six out of the last seven. They've won three on the trot against three very good yeah. teams. They've got five teams and none of them are in the eight. I just heard a siren in the background. Is that, is that What the hell is that about? No, it's not, but I, I, I'm a bit nervous because I'll tell you this, I shouldn't. Twice I got stopped with a siren coming down yesterday for speeding. Oh, okay, uh, right, One okay. I got off, one I didn't. Right, okay. Well, I mean, as you know, there's plenty of ads on the TV more. telling you at the moment just to lay off the accelerator, just take in and ease it in them. There's no race. Well, You're going to well, get home. I got a ticket for 114 k's after I'd completed uh, um, an execution and a passing lane, and this uh, cop stopped me. She, I'd have to say she was extremely pleasant, uh, very good-natured, and a thoroughly nice person. And you know, she was kind to me and said, you know, and I said, oh, 
114 in a passing lane. I said, I thought there was a bit of discretion that you usually gave in the passing lane to get past the slow traffic. And she said, um, sir, uh, there's no reason why you have to go past 100 kilometres an hour, even if you're overtaking. And if you can't do that, you don't need to overtake because the vehicle in front of you is probably going close to 100 k's. And I said, OK, OK. Yeah, fair enough. So yeah, she, slapped enough. Me with, yeah. she slapped, well, slapped me with an $80 well, fine. Well, you've got, um, you got to pass the uh, attitude like, test, like, mate. That's the first thing that they do. All right, we've got two more topics yeah. to talk about. We've got the Ashes and we've got uh, the Bledisloe Cup because the Bledisloe Cup kind of slipped, uh, has slipped under the radar b- b- bizarrely because of this Football Women's World yeah, Cup. Yeah. Just a quick question. You don't want to change the ashes, do you? This call about, oh, okay, you've actually got to win the trophy outright. Australia don't give a stuff, mate. They've, no, they, you know, no, keep, no, no, no. keep it as no. it is. You can't, you, you, you can't, you can't twist and change history. If you do, you, you rob it of all of its beauty and its romance. And um, yes, there's a lot of kind of eccentric things that go on in sport, um, but they've been that like that for a hundred years. I mean, you know, I just think in golf, St Andrews the most famous golf course in the world, but it's only got 12 greens. Because when golf was first played on that course 150 years ago, golf was a round of 12 holes. And so you occasionally get people say, oh, no, 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 you know, change it, get, get, put another six greens in there. They don't. They've got six greens that are very big and uh, they're used on two different holes. So that's an example of the eccentricity, which is an important part of the history of a lot of sports. And so don't tamper uh, with the fittest low cup. I mean, yeah, it's hard to win it, uh, uh, you know, as far as Australia goes. But the other strange thing about these test matches between the Wallabies and the All Blacks, doesn't matter how many years we go hanging on to the Bledisloe Cup, I still absolutely sit on the edge of my seat every time those two countries run out onto the field for a rugby test, and I'll be doing it again this weekend. Why? why, why hang on a second. Why is it, you've got to explain this. You see, I keep trying to tell Lachlan, who's obviously a lot younger than me, I said, OK, there's generations of all-black fans that grew up before 2011 that would have just thought, oh, my God, we're a great team that chokes at World Cups. If you grew up and you're of the age around about the late 80s, early 90s, and then again the late 90s, you would have grown up where the Wallabies were consistently better than the All Blacks. If you've grown up in the last generation, well, you've grown up where the Wallabies are bloody hopeless and they can't win the Bledisloe Cup off us. Yeah. But um, it's it's true, but somehow that old ancient rivalry still comes to the fore at the start of each match. And, uh, you you know, some old blokes will tell you one thing about sport, mate, you know, every time you lose, you're just that much a bit closer to winning your next match. And so someday, one day, the Wallabies will beat the All Blacks. Uh, You can put your money on that, but it could be this week. That sly old fox, Eddie Jones, but his credibility is going down the rabbit hole pretty quickly, isn't it? Well, it has to. I mean, look, you know, he, 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 the one thing he's got is that if they beat the All Blacks and out, they've got two tests before the World Cup, if they manage to snick one of these, then he's got nothing to worry about. If we beat them back to back and he goes in on a four or five match losing streak, even though they're on the kinder side of the draw, everyone's going to be lining them up. All he's got to do is get out of that group stage. They've got a very favourable knockout draw and then into a semi-final if they win it. And, and if you finish top four yeah, in the yeah. World Cup, job yeah. done for him. Yeah, yeah, probably, yeah. But um, anyway... So, the other well, thing I wanted to bring up just we're, we're, before you go, mate, is um, that yeah. uh, yesterday was the, what, 90, it was 40, 43rd, 42nd anniversary of the Springbok Tour match against Waikato being called off. Um, oh, okay. yeah. And played some remarkable audio from that time. Brendan, I mean, you know, you're, you're a little bit older than me, but, I, you know, I was trying to tell Lachlan again yesterday, I said, mate, it just is bizarre to me now that I look back at it. It yeah. seems so real and it doesn't seem like it was that long ago. But yeah. New Zealand as a country, it's, man, we have actually changed a, a, a hell of a lot since that time. Well, we have, and I think uh, that Springbok Tour played a big part in changing the social attitude of a lot of people in New Zealand who thought rugby was the only thing that mattered in this world. And uh, people like Ron Don and Rob Muldoon um, were the kind of, you know, the strong advocates of this argument. Rugby's rugby. It's got nothing to do with politics, which was complete nonsense. Sport has got everything to do uh, with politics. It's part and part and part and parcel of, you know, the uh, political life, whether you like it or not. And so that changed our attitude. And a lot of people who probably were surprised that they got out and protested against that tour sort of came of age, you know, and realised what uh, racism is all about and understood it a lot better. And so I think it's changed our attitudes for the better. And so, uh, yeah, I always liken that day 
to a two or three, what I call the JFK day. I can remember when I was 13 years of age, remember the morning I turned on the radio and my mother was almost in tears when she heard that John F. Kennedy had been assassinated in Dallas. And I can remember explicitly where I was. I was at the movies with my children on the day that the Waikato match was abandoned. And at half time, uh, I went out uh, during the half time break, I went into my car and turned on the car radio. And John Housen was talking about how the match had been abandoned. So I went back inside the theatre and told my kids, kids, you're on your own. I'm listening to the radio. Um, and I sat in the car and followed the dramatic events on that day on a Saturday afternoon in, in Hamilton back in 1980. When was it? July 1981. Yeah, 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 yeah crazy. And then from that yeah. point on, the protests went up another level because I think you know that yeah. from that well, Mole Street yeah. happened after that when the batons came out, and then all of a sudden we saw the helmets and and you know and, we and haven't seen anything. And you know. I'll, I'll leave you one story. Uh, I, I got quite a bit of flack because I didn't. Work, I refused to work on the Springbok tour, which we were all entitled to do. But a, a few people at work uh, were supportive of him, including Derek Fox. You remember Derek? Fox? I remember Derek. Yeah, uh, he was. He's a he, great he guy. Actually, he's a really good broadcaster too. Actually, yeah, he, he, very good broadcaster. He came up to me one day, a, month, a couple of months after the tour, and said, "As you tell, he said, just as a way of thank you for if we always stand on the Springbok tour, would you like to come along to the Maori Sports uh, dinner out at uh, University out at Glen Innes?" And um, he said, oh, you can be my guest. And I said, yeah, OK, OK. I thought, oh, this would be good. It would be really enjoyable. So I went to this dinner, went up to the bar at one stage to buy a couple of, bar, <laughs> of good drinks. And a couple of Maori guys turned and said, hey, tell for it. And the F word came out. Why the F were you not working on the Springbok tour? You're a bloody rugby commentator, for God's sake, not a protester. And here I was thinking I was in this lovely, warm, supportive <laughs> environment. <laughs> and I was... I was coughing at the whole, you know, whole nine yards of it from these two guys at the bar. And I went back and I said to, I remember telling Foxy, I said, Foxy, don't invite, don't don't invite, invite me, me to the don't don't invite again me in any hurry. Yeah. Drive anyway. carefully, mate. It sounds as though you're going to need to, okay? See you and see you next week. Yeah, well, I, well I'm not driving, so I think we'll be okay, yeah. <laughs>